Hi, good evening everybody and welcome to this evening's webinar. Uh, tonight coming live from the Schoen Clinic in central London. Uh, so we've come back out on the road uh, after a couple of webinars coming from our offices in Manchester. Uh, so welcome to everyone. It's been a couple of uh, months since we did our last webinar, so I'm glad you all joined us. I'm sure you're all webinared out, but it's good to see from the numbers uh, that we still have over 300 people registered for tonight's webinar. Thank you, Giles, for popping over. So yes, coming live from the showing clinic this evening, my name's Stuart Hogg. I'm the sales director here at Osser. Um, thank you all for attending this evening's webinar. Uh, a couple of familiar faces who have done a couple of webinars uh, over the last 12 months uh, with us. So we can pass over to the other side of the room uh, and introduce Mr. Paul Tricker and Andrew Goodall. Paul is a consultant orthopedic surgeon at St. Peter's uh, and Andrew Goodall is a clinical specialist orthotist at Pure Sports Medicine. Um, so it's good to see there's still an appetite out there for education. Uh, so thank you and hope you enjoy it the next hour. Uh, Paul will go through our presentation, uh, followed by a, a live patient assessment. We've got Will with us this evening, uh, and then followed on with Andrew, uh, again, doing a presentation on uh, the deviations uh, of managing the injured knee. So if you've not joined our webinars before, I'll just pop up the housekeeping slide. So this is based on a Zoom format. I'm sure you're all Zoomed out by now. Um, but if you do have any questions, we've got Giles, uh, who's manning the Q&A function tonight. So please do put any questions you have into that function at the bottom of Zoom. Uh, and then Giles will be able to ask Andrew and Paul uh, live this evening. Uh, there's also a chat function, so if you've got any technical issues, just pop them in there, but hopefully everything's going okay so far. Uh, the session is recorded, as always, and then posted on the Osser Academy YouTube channel and also the osser.co.uk webinar channel, and that's usually posted at some point next week. Uh, so if you have any colleagues who aren't able to um, join us this evening, then uh, please send in the link once it's posted, and you'll find also the back catalogue uh, of over 25 KOL webinars that we've done over the last 12 months. You will receive a, a certificate for attending this evening, so do check your junk box because sometimes it goes in there, but you'll receive that probably by the end of the week, if not by the beginning of next week. Uh, and also there's some follow-up questionnaires, so it's really uh, good if you can fill that out in terms of topics or how we can make these webinars uh, a bit better as we move, hopefully, out of COVID. Uh, we like to keep this digital learning format alive, so it'd be good to, to, to get some ideas from you guys uh, to make it a bit more interesting and engaging uh, from the audience themselves. So please do take time to follow um, and fill all those, those follow-up questionnaires and for us, that'd be really good. Um, so again, should be about an hour. Um, coming live, as I said, from the show and clinic, I'm going to pass over to a couple of experienced webinars, guys who have done a couple of these before, really entertaining and really engaging and more importantly, very educational. So with that, I'm going to pass over to Mr. Paul Tricker. Hi, everyone. Uh, I think Andy's going to kick off. Yeah, well. so thanks for the lovely introduction, Stuart. Apparently, I'm an orthotist now, which is nice. I've just gained that qualification on, <laughs> on, on, on arrival, which is nice. Um, today, we want to talk about the injured knee. We'll talk a bit about surgery, a bit about those that haven't had surgery, any deviations that occur and how we would look to manage those, try to work out what's going on. Um, and we'll have a patient as well, which we'll go through, a bit of a live exam, um, and there'll be some back and forth between uh, Paul and I, hopefully to just uh, give each other a little bit of stick and try to work out um, how we go about managing these patients. Perfect, so this is gonna be interactive if we can, guys, so please ask questions. Um, this is the injured knee. There will be a lot of focus on the ACL because that's what Andy and I primarily do, but we all obviously manage all in knee injuries. So do ask questions. So I'm just gonna share my screen and we're gonna run through the first presentation. And this is gonna be knee assessment. So. This is based not just in COVID times, but things you want to be doing, but things, if you're going to continue with remote assessments, uh, these are things you want to be thinking about. If I can get my thing to work, just one second. Okay, so the most important question I ask when I see any patient with a knee, a painful knee is, has there been an injury or not? So has there been an injury? It could be just, um, can they walk? Do they have a straight leg raise? And is there swelling? If there's not a knee injury and it's more a, 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 a pain that's come on either suddenly or, or with time, then you want to think of patterns. And this slide hopefully will give you everything you need to know about the knee with no injury. So the gray ones are the, the more pediatric base, Osgood Schlatter's, the so-called growing pains around puberty, osteochondral injuries and osteochondritis desiccans or biomechanical issues. And don't forget the referred pain from the spine or the hip. 
And then you've got the acute pains, the red flags, the infection, septic arthritis. More often than not, it's acute gout, but you want to rule out septic arthritis. And then the tumours and PVNS, they're the very rare things, and we're all worried about these, in particular missing, missing these in remote consultations, but you can go for your red flags to pick these up. And then people fall into either patellofemoral pain and tendonitis, generalised arthritis, the degenerative meniscal tear. And these patients generally, apart from the, uh, the green ones, can be managed uh, non-operatively to start with. So these are your, your, your non-injured patients. And that's, and that's a little a slide to help you remember what to go through. And what if there's an injury? I put this up on every talk I give. If you've got a traumatic hemarthrosis, you have either fractured your knee, torn your extensor mechanism, ruptured your ligament, and in an adolescent, if you have blood in your knee, the chance of it being your ACL is 65%. You've got a large meniscal tear, often amenable to repair, or you've had a traumatic patellar dislocation. So more often than not, patients will give you a video um, of how they did, did their injury. Skateboarders, wakeboarders, snowboarders, video everything they do. This guy's no um, exception. And hopefully you can all pick the diagnosis. Now I'm wondering about his ACL. Okay, ACL and the mechanism of injuries here, the dynamic valgus you can see. So what do I look for? I want to see the patients walk. So I, I go and get the patients, I watch them walk down the corridor and I get them to stand. I'm checking their alignment. Alignment is a key to all knee injuries and knee uh, degenerative pathology. Uh, valgus, not need, varus, bow legs. Can you see an effusion? Can you see fixed flexion? Can you see malalignment? And can you see a range of movement? And I assess that by getting, to, getting them to squat. Look at varus on the, on, the, on the frontal plane here. You can see the right knee's varus. You can see there's a fixed flexion deformity. Get them to do a straight leg raise and I'm just going to go through, this isn't a specific order, but these are things that I commonly get asked about during the exam. McMurray's test, put your fingers on the joint line, as you can see on the left hand, internally rotate the knee, fully flex the knee, slowly externally rotate. Your thumb is on the lateral meniscus in this picture. Your fingers are on the medial meniscus and you're a little bit of firm pressure and you can elicit pain. Rather than doing that, you can get the patient to squat. Then I get the patient to sit on the end of the bed and I, I look at their patellofemoral tracking and you can best do this from above. On this left knee, you can see a positive J sign of mal tracking. On the right, this is a young girl who's had an MPFL, patella stabilizing procedure, and you can see that her, um, her mal tracking has been eliminated. Hyperlaxity, EDS, it's, it's becoming a lot more common. I don't know if you're seeing this. Patients often say I've got hyperlaxity syndrome or my mom, my mom and grandma or my sister's got EDS, um, ask about hyperlaxity. It's important in ligamentous injuries. It's Are you seeing more? Yeah, I think it's important to also embrace like the, the spectrum of this as well. You know, yeah. you see some that have got hypermobility in certain joints and whatnot. What we're talking about here is those that have got generalised hyperlaxity. Uh, yeah. And that's important, especially when we're talking about things like ACL injuries and ligament injuries. Okay, okay and then I get the position of an anterior draw. I don't actually do the anterior draw. I, I try and do it. I will do it. But in an acute injury, it's difficult. But more, I look at the posterior sag, as you can see on this knee. And then you can do a posterior draw, okay, for the PCL, landing on the knee, dashboard injuries, taken out front on and on rugby, uh, car crashes, their kind of injuries. What, what don't you like about the, the, the draw for for instance, for an ACL, is there, is there anything that you don't like about it? So I think anterior draw is very, has a reduced sensitivity compared to Lachman. I think we'll hopefully demonstrate that on, uh, on Will later. I think on the acute injury, it's very difficult to, to, to do. Okay. The patients don't like it. Just getting the knee to 90 is difficult enough. Um, and I think knee surgeons generally won't use the anterior draw. They will do it as part of assessing for PCL sag or assessing for posterior lack. Yeah, I just don't like it because of the hamstring tension you can yeah. get, which gives you those false negatives. So we did the Lachman, which is in, in effect an anterior draw at 30 degrees. Often, as you'll see, I put my knee under the thigh, but if you don't, or you're wearing a skirt, as you tend to do in clinic, I think. Always. 
um, you can wear a, uh, a put a um, pillow under the knee. This is a, a in theatre, so it, it, it um, exaggerates the clinical findings. Here's the Lachman. Okay, so this is the big ACL laxative, and this is just a pivot shift. This is a, a medial meniscal repair. The eagle eye would have seen MM repair, and that exaggerates the laxity. When you lose your meniscus, the laxity is worse. Uh, people talk about pivot shifts. So on the left, you've got a, um, a pivot shift with a patient asleep, and people go, I don't do the pivot shift. If you have a positive pivot shift, it is an ACL rupture. And then on the right, this is one in clinic, and you can get them to shift. If you get the patient on, on, on side, you get them relaxed, okay? It's not a painful um, examination, but you've got to get the patient relaxed. Yeah, I think the key is they need to kind of understand that they need to be relaxed to make it a successful test. And then the handling, I think, is it's not complex, but you just need to be confident with your handling. If you're confident with your handling, then it's a, it's a worthwhile test. Do you do pivot? Yeah. yeah. Do you pivot your post-ops? Uh, not routinely. Okay. We'll talk about that one later. Okay, and what is a pivot shift? The pivot shift, this is how you do it. You hold the limb straight, two hands if you like, you internally rotate in extension, and then you bend the knee to about 30 degrees and you put a bit of valgus. We'll show this later, but the tibia is sitting in an anterior sublux position and it pops back. It clicks or shifts back to underneath the femur. That's what the shivet, uh, pivot shift is. And then the PCL, don't forget the PCL. Um, you can sit on the end of the leg. This is a quads active test. Get the patient to tense their quads and you can exaggerate the posterior sag of a PCL. That's a quads active test. If there's a positive ACL or PCL sign, I'll do the dial test. The dial test at 30 degrees signifies a posterior lateral complex injury. And I'll tell you about that in a second and at 90 degrees suggests a PCL and a posterior lateral complex injury. In this picture, I don't like this examination because I like someone to hold the knees together. Otherwise, the knee can move and exaggerate any laxity. Okay, so the posterior lateral corner. So the non-medics and physios switch away for a couple of anatomy pictures. So what is it? It's really straightforward the way I remember it and teach it to our registrars as well is you think of the posterior lateral corner and the posterior medial side to have two triangles. On the lateral side, you have, well, you have the ITB on the surface, and then you have this structure called the LCL. Behind that, you have the popliteus, and the, and the bottom of the triangle is the popliteal fibular ligament and the fibular head, okay? It's a simple triangle, and the, behind the uh, fibular head, you, all, all the physios in particular, and, and dot medics here will know there's biceps, attached as part of the conjoint tendon, and you've got the ITB. But at the knee joint level, you have this basic triangle. The front is the lateral collateral ligament. On the medial side, something similar. You've got the medial collateral ligament at the front. You've got the, um, uh, I've got, gone mad now, POL, posterior oblique ligament, begins with P, and you've got the semimembranosus tendon. And on the medial side, it's like a sail of a ship, and that's the triangle on the posterior medial corner. So the superficial medial uh, collateral on the front of the medial side, lateral ligament on the front of the lateral side, something beginning with P at the back, posterior oblique ligament on the medial side, popliteus on the lateral side, and then you've got the popliteal fibular ligament on the, on the lateral side, and the semimembranosus on the posterior medial side. And these are a, a complex triangular structure, it's not just one structure. Okay, so what do we talk about with rehab? Did you want to ask me? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, like, why are we why are we concerned, or why do we need to pick up the postural lateral corner injury? Um, I know we said we wouldn't talk too much ACL, but why why do we need to pick that up early? Because if you miss a posterior lateral corner and just do the UCL, ACL cross, it's easier, and everyone can do an ACL, it will fail. The patient will remain in varus, and then they'll go into chronic varus and recovatum, and end up with osteoarthritis or needing an osteotomy when this becomes chronic. So the posterior lateral corner, but more importantly, the posterior medial corner, a lot of people leave the MCL. We're gonna talk about uh, when rehab doesn't go according to plan, but when, when what we look for is missed laxities. Why is the patient giving way? Why are they, 
ongoing instability. Why are they getting pain? Why are they getting swelling? Because they have missed laxity. So it's important to pick these injuries up. Okay, so rehab. Okay, a surgeon's perspective. You all know that we talk a lot about rehab and most of the rest of the conversations we'll be talking about rehab. From a surgical perspective, a meniscal repair will uh, involve avoiding deep squatting for many months, up to four months on a big lateral meniscal tear. There is some evidence to support bracing, but the key is to avoid deep rotational squats. And with chondral injury, this is the only reason I would put someone non-weight bearing, but with a load of bracing, I, I do tend to allow them to weight bear. And the stakes are high when the meniscus and chondral surfaces are involved. So take your time, re redress your time frames and expectations. There's evidence to support an accelerated rehab program. There's evidence to support unrestricted immediate range of movement and immediate weight bearing apart from what I've just mentioned with cartilage injuries. Early open chain is fine within a functional range, 90 to 45, but I think that's becoming more and more aggressive towards open chain as well and definitely early closed chain as well. I'm gonna get Will in a minute, but I'm just gonna mention two things we noticed in the immediate rehab with a lateral tenodesis, which you all will become much more aware of and you should be seeing a lot more in clinic. The principles for that are the ACL is meant to control rotational stability. Okay, if you put something in the middle of the knee, it's less stable, particularly if you put it in vertically, which was the way traditional ACL reconstructions were put in. You can imagine it doesn't give you as much rotational stability. That's why we put something on the side, be it an anterior lateral ligament or a lateral tenodesis. In reality, that looks like a small scar on the outside um, of, the, of the knee based on the lateral epicondyle. You take a strip of ITB, as you can see on the left picture. Okay, you tuck it under the lateral collateral ligament, as you can see in the middle picture, and you staple that down in pretty much zero tension, uh, just proximal and posterior to the lateral epicondyle. That's called a modified Lemaire procedure or a LET or a lateral extra articular tenodesis. This area will limit the patient in the first month. They'll get a hematoma if, if you don't correct uh, or, or, or show, um, you know, stop the bleeding at time of surgery. And this is the thing that hurts the most in the first month. Agreed? Yeah, definitely. And I, I think it's, it's one that we know adds value. It definitely reduces the re-rupture rate, especially in those that are hyperlaxity and those that qualify uh, for it. But the other thing is it's a bigger wound. Um, it's lateral around a sensitive area anyway. And you just need to take, take your time a little bit and make sure that you're not overstressing and over-irritating that region just in that early phase. And then it tends to fall in line again. Okay. So in my practice, all revisions get an LET. All patients with hyperlaxity all uh, patients under the age of 25, particularly because they're, they're at the higher risk of revision. All patients who've got uh, a, a big posterior tibial slope and um, even more so with a, a big lateral meniscal repair because that's, that's the most important thing, protecting the meniscus. And an LET or a lateral procedure has been shown to reduce the re-rupture rates from about 14, 15% to about 4%. The other thing patients notice in the first month is numbness. And I came across this nice diagram. So that infrapatellar branch of, of the SN, which is a saphenous nerve there, is often injured when you harvest the hamstrings, resulting in a numb patch. And that's what you need to tell your patients. And that numb patch is, is the area of that numb patch is the largest in the first month and can decrease in size significantly. It's not often a problem unless the patients get a neuroma. And then you've got the pre rehab principles, nine to 10 months of a structured rehab program, a structured rehab program. That is, for me, supervised physiotherapy, um, not something that you can routinely do remotely, although there's some evidence coming out that people are trying to do that. But for me, ACL rehab is hands-on. Uh, return to sport testing, I think, is paramount for anyone returning to any kind of sport. Uh, not to underestimate the psychological readiness for tests and, and Andy's gonna to touch on that later. 
and ACL prevention because there is a significant chance of re-rupturing the other side. This is a, a talk a lot of you have, a lot of a lot of you have seen this slide from Adam Meekins, who talks about the reality versus uh, what, what many think the rehab will be like. It's it's never a straight line. There's lots of things that can interfere with this uh, timeline, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the things in terms of symptoms, pain, swelling, stiffness, instability, reduced quad strength, and we've touched about the braced knee and rehabbing these uh, in the post-operative phase. These things will touch your patients at least once. Yeah, definitely. And th these are the bits that I'm looking to cover. I'll go through, you know, those deviations, those outliers that roughly sit in these boxes and how we sort of address those as we go forward. And poor surgery is important. OK, I, th I think people don't flag it up enough. I think most people I'd like to think work in an MDT set setting. I get phone calls, emails from physios all the time saying, do you mind having a little look at X or Y? Or do you mind having a second opinion on, 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 on my patient? I'm worried about his surgery. And it's a difficult point to, to raise. And maybe we can talk about that later and how we at what point do you refer back to your surgeon? And, and I think there's too much people worried about what other people are going to say and and mm. and we, we can talk about how how those phone calls should go and how those no i think the key is like we're all medical professionals we want the best for the patient correct and, and if it helps to have a second opinion whether it be physio uh, or surgeon we should be open to that and i think that's key okay. um there's just one quick question because i finished but yes go. Uh, one quick question from julia arthur uh, and i think Part of this comes with what you were talking about about discussion between the surgeon and the physio but does a uh, lateral tenodesis change the rehab protocol for, for either of you or do you feel it should yeah so uh, it slows down the start basically um we need to just appreciate the fact that it's going to be a bit more sore um it's going to it's going to help you as you go forwards through the kind of mid and end stage because you're going to have a lot more feeling of rotational stability um but at the start you just need to appreciate that you've got a bigger wound and, and, and it's it's more surgery basically Thank you very much. Any, any more questions? Yeah, that's it, Sam. Okay. Uh, yeah, you have to watch for hematoma. So really ice that first month. So we're going to get Will in now, um, who is our patient volunteer, and we'll run for an assessment with him. So the first thing we do is watch him walk. Okay. So he's got his little ACL brace and just stand still there. Can you just turn and face the... So we're looking at his alignment. Okay, do you want to take your brace off for me, Will? Oh, Andy, do you want to go? Yeah. Oops. Okay. This will just give us a better look at the alignment. It will give us a better look at the sort of uh, muscle tissue. Uh, and it will allow us to just do the, the early stage of the assessment. And just put your feet together for me. So he's a touch varus already. His left knee is a little bit varus compared to his right. Okay. And just give your, give your feet a little bit of space, I suppose. And then can you squat? Is it sore? Quite sore. Okay, well, so come and have a seat. Okay, so you can just sit there for a minute. Um, well, Sam, let's one for a quick history. So we've met before. Yeah. Okay, so Will, how old are you? I've just turned 16. And you're at school? Yeah. Uh, what, lower six or GCSE? Uh, GCSE, yeah. Just finished. Just finished? Go all right? Uh, yeah, no, they went pretty well. Okay, so Dad's here, so obviously you're going to say that. And um, what's, your, what's your sport? Uh, my sport is hockey. Anything else? No, I don't really play anything else. Just, just mainly hockey. Okay, and what level of hockey do you play? Do you play for school? I play at the top. The top level that I play is under sixteen England, and I just made the starting eleven this season. So, well, that was recent, was it? Yeah, yeah, just recent. So you're starting England first team, yeah? Yep, starting England under sixteen. First. Okay, what position do you play? Uh, centre back, so defender. Centre back. Okay, so you're quite good. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to think so. Okay, and do you play club hockey? I do. I spoke club hockey, yeah. Age, age or against men? Um, mainly against men. I do so play my age group, but mainly against men, yeah. And you play 
centre back. Centre back, yeah. Okay, grass or astroturf? Astroturf. Okay, and have you had an injury? Yes, I have partially torn my ACL. Okay, how did you do that? I twisted it whilst playing. There was no no one around me, just out of the blue, just turned and then it was quite a bit painful. Okay, and to take me exactly through it, you're playing on AstroTurf. Play on AstroTurf. It's well, a well, new well, AstroTurf, so it's quite grippy, quite, you know, there. Then I just got a new pair of Astros for my birthday, which are also very new, very grippy. So I planted my foot and changed direction. I felt something go in my knee, but I was able to play on because it just felt like there was nothing there. I then woke up the next morning. My knee was swollen and I couldn't extend it or put any weight on it. Okay. And were you limping then? Yeah, I was definitely limping. And then what happened? You iced it or? Yeah, I iced it and then I went to a &E. I got my extra and then I was referred for an MR. So you went to a &E Yeah. Because you were sore. Because it was, yeah, very painful. Okay, so most people who end up in a &E normally have done something significant. Okay, fracture, big, big, those things we talked about earlier, this traumatic hemarthrosis. Okay, um, just have a seat for me. But just have a seat, just face Andy. Just perch your legs, shuffle back. Sit, shuffle back. Uh, if you can come over here from Sue, just on the top. So when I talk about the J sign, just straighten this leg out for me. And you can see that he's got a positive J sign. The kneecap is facing the camera, should be facing the roof, go up. So it goes like that, okay. So he has got some malalignment of his kneecap and it's facing there. Pull your, pull your feet, pull your legs together. Okay, straighten out again, let me show it. Is that coming up? Okay, so it's got a positive J sign there. Did you get any kneecap pain? Mm, not in this one, no. Okay, have a lie there. Okay, so, you comfy? Yeah. You've got to tell me. So he's quite sore um, in extension, so we're going to be a little bit ginger with him. It was three weeks ago, wasn't it? Yeah, three weeks. So, again, from the front, we, did, we saw him walk in, but you can see the various uh, picture, that malalignment picture of patellofemoral syndrome. That's what we typically see, particularly in this age group. Okay, so the other thing I want to do here is just show how much hyperextension he's got. Maybe best from the side there. Okay, and that's going to be important if we do anything. Okay, just tell me if it's too much. So he, he can go. Yeah, it's a bit sore. That, a bit sore. Okay. Lift this leg up straight. Oh, one more thing. That was, so obviously, effusion we want to check. So okay. this was three weeks ago now, right? Yeah, yeah three weeks. Bit of so it's still a little bit. A little bit of a fusion. Then I want to do a straight leg raise. Lift up straight. Hold it there for me. Okay, and bend the knee for me. The key thing I'm seeing there, Paul, is there's still a there's an extension lag as a result of his yeah. quads, probably because of pain at this point. Correct. Okay, so, and then I drop the knee out. The medial meniscus is not up here. Okay, it's always back here. We do it on every exam, quite posterior. Any pain? Mm, not much, just a little bit. Okay. And then on the outside, we're doing the lateral meniscus as well. Yeah, that's the one that hurts that one. It's all there? Yeah. Okay, so already I'm thinking lateral structure. Okay, then we do the MCL, 30 degrees and at zero, lateral side. Okay, and then I'm gonna do the dial test. But before I do that, obviously the ACL. Okay, put your feet together. Okay, so there's your position. Okay, you're looking. You haven't got a pen in your pocket, have you? Either? Okay. And you're looking, looking at putting the pen on the tibial tubercle. Is there a sag? Is one of them dropped back? That's what you, we don't want to miss the PCL. Okay. And we can do an anterior draw. You can let, let that one down, go down. Look good to you. Well, that's the, that's the thing that I don't like. Often you get that guarding. And, and I wouldn't say that looks excessively lax from, from the, where I'm sitting, although there is, a, there is a little bit of movement. You could miss that, I'd say. Okay. And then I'll put my foot under his thigh and I'll do a lap. This is important. This is where I talk to the patient, make sure they're relaxed. Maybe from back there, the grid. Okay, and just for this to work and the rest of the exam to be 
functional, he's got to be relaxed. Okay, hand on the thigh, and you can. I think you can see relaxity there. Yeah. And there's a big difference when you when you observe that compared to the anterior draw. There's there's a very yeah. discernible difference I find. And and if you can get your hands in right for the lack one, I think it's it's the most valuable in diagnosing the ACL. And if you don't put your leg underneath, watch. It's not as bad. You haven't relaxed the hamstring. Okay, so that's quite a, a key. Putting something under there, getting them relaxed, letting these hamstrings tension off, you get your diagnosis. Okay, so I'm gonna before I do the pivot, I'm just gonna do the post, the dial test. Okay, so when I do a dial test, 30 degrees, and you just hold the knees together, get someone to hold the knees or the dad or the relative, and do the dial test. Okay. And I'm looking for one, as I showed you on my slides, one opening up more than the other. Does that hurt? Mm, a little bit. It doesn't feel right, but it's not that painful. No. Over here? Yeah. Okay. It's got a negative dial. Okay, completely relaxed. So pivot. I'll do last. Hold the leg. Internally rotate. And then you're just trying to get the subluxed tibia. I think you can see it subluxed a little bit, actually. Okay, and you're going to try and get it to shift back. Yeah. It's just got a little pivot glide, I'd call that, grade one pivot. And the key here is even, you know, we're doing this on, on film, you know, it's hard for all to completely relax. You know, it's the first time we've sort of examined him properly. But you the handling that Paul's demonstrating there is the key. If you can get your hand in right, in a better environment, you can't. And other people do other other ways. Some people just do it. But he's not jumping up and down. If you do it relaxed, would it hurt when you do it? Uh, it does hurt a bit. Okay. <laughs> okay, all back. okay, so we'll stop that. So then you, if you if, if there's a dial test, you can check it by getting the patient prone. Um, is there anything you'd... No, so um, he's got a negative yeah. dial in that position. I mean, I would normally do it prone. I just find it's easier to control the knees. Okay. Um, but to be honest, not really. Um, I would probably meniscal really sweep. Shorter. I'd probably meniscal sweep like the Murray's or something like that, but yeah. we've seen that. But... And do you want to have a look? Do you want to see what you think? Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing here, uh, the only the only uh, discussion we, we, we've had is obviously we've been informed that this is a partial injury. Um, so when we're talking partial injury, what we're looking for is there's, you know, you should really get a bit of an end feel. And, and when I've had a feel of this, this knee, there's a bit of an end feel. But I wouldn't say I'm still, I'm interested to know how partial, if that makes sense. That it does feel like it's it's got a fair bit of laxity. So this is this is where one of the major things we need to discuss now Thanks, is um, is is the scan. So we've got a scan. The scan suggests partial rupture. It shows a one centimeter, ten millimeters of anterior translation, which tells you the ACL avoidance. Okay, and so when you treat the scan, it's a partial ACL rupture. Down we go down the non-operative route. Okay, and that's why. In essence, we are brought him here today because it's not always about the scan. That diagnosis um, was made clinically. Yeah. The history, although he carried on playing, okay, carried on playing tells me no ACL, but the next day, a and &E, he's a high-level hockey player. He plays, I've seen videos from dad of what he gets up to. Okay, he plays against a man, he's pretty hard, he played on. And central defenders in all sports don't do much. Joking. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so that, he, you know, there was a significant injury and he had a de delayed hemarthrosis. Yeah. Okay. My point would be he was on his own, he did a pivot and he felt something. Correct. Irrelevant of whether he plays on or not. If he's on his own, there's no contact, he's turned and something and he's felt something. He's probably an ACL in the, until it's walled out. Basically. Yeah, so we brought him along today because we had a, a good couple of chats about his his options and and yeah so you want to you had a few questions didn't you Will? yeah yeah now i just want to know what's probably the best option to go forward so whether that's surgery and or or rehab and then i've sorry not rehab just straight into rehab no surgery and i've researched them myself whilst i've been at home there were three types of surgery that could be artificial hamstring graft or patella so I'm just curious of which one you think would be the best option for me so I can come back to that elite level standard. So what, what, what did you think when you looked it up? When I looked it up, I sort of probably leant towards the idea of surgery as 
the level and intensity that hockey is played at is fast, really fast. So I think if I'm going to come back to it, I want to be as the, in the strongest possible like position that I can be. And what do you think, if you did have surgery, what the success is like? Well, I, I didn't really want to worry myself with whether it's a large success rate or uh, like small one. But I think that my dad said it's quite a high success rate for what he's done. Okay. So I think the high success rate of the surgery and how I want to come back is surgery probably the best option. But also what did what I did think about was my age. Yeah. So what where you would drill if that changes the surgery completely or whether yeah. it doesn't or there are more risks to it of my age because yeah. of growing plates. So I'm just wondering what you think could be the best option for me going forwards. Okay, so at 16, yeah. and without embarrassing you in front of everybody, obviously well past puberty, yeah? Uh, and, you know, we, we, tr we would pretty much treat you like an adult. The growth plates are nearly fused in your scan. That's what we saw. Yeah. But there are obviously perceived risks. Dad's a bit taller. You know, you may grow. Okay, but we use techniques to try and minimize that risk. In much younger children, we try and avoid drilling across the growth plates, et cetera. Yeah. So that's, that's the A-level stuff. Yeah. Um, as you were listening to, you'd probably get a team of thesis, whatever we did, to, to augment you and, and give you that extra strength, particularly because you've got a bit of high laxity. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, there's no meniscal tests. Yeah. And, you know, we... In, in, to, to, to all the intense purposes, your ACL is gone. Okay, on scan, there might be a few fibers attached. Um, and that's why this debate about and this discussion, of course, you know, Andy treats a lot of people non operatively. I treat a lot of people non operatively as well, even as a surgeon, that's what we do. And, but you, at your, you know, you just reached probably the pinnacle of your age group career. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's an important discussion to have. In terms of graft strength, we've talked about you being a centre back. You're not that quick. Uh, no, he said it, that it wasn't bad. You, you know, in terms of it's, you, pace isn't your strongest asset. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, and patella tendon and morbidity about taking the, the, the front on. on yeah. Do you need, you, obviously, you don't need to kneel. You don't kneel. No. Uh, no, no, I don't. Yeah. Really and quads, we, quads, we didn't, you probably didn't even read on quads tendon, did no, you? No, I didn't. No, okay, fine. Well, quads and patella are pretty similar, but they're, they're involving since either down the front of the knee or the top or the bottom. And they take a, a, a more predictable amount of, uh, of tendon, of graft, and probably, probably slightly reduced re rupture rate in the patella tendon. But there's, I can tell you that debate's gone on for 25 years and people yeah. still advocate both. I think for, as I said, position dependent for me, for you, yeah. If, you are, if you're a winger and super quick, I'm taking another tendon. Um, but hamstrings and lateral tenodesis, or patella tendon lateral tenodesis are valid options. I don't think synthetics, you should go anywhere near for an ACL. No, um, yeah, I did, I did read that, on that. Yeah. So. The other thing is, I was thinking you're going to talk about, about repair of the ACL, yeah. where we can get you back potentially quicker. Um, but that's not using a donor graft. Yeah. And that might be an option. However, it would depend on how much ACL tissue is there. And a very firm understanding that the re-rupture rate is up to 40%, 45% in the youngsters. It's a valid option, a viable option, but the evidence isn't quite there yet. Yeah. It was done many years ago and we abandoned it because the re-rupture rates are high, but newer techniques and people are doing it. And it depends on what we find when we get in there, but we know yours is pulled off the top. So you might be a good candidate, but you're running the gauntlet. And for the long term, I don't term. think I don't think a, a repair would last long in you okay. at your level. I think if you're your swan song season, your last one, you had six months to go, then you know, more dad's age than your age. You might have it, but the, the repair is good for you. You know, if you were nine, I might repair it. Okay, but um, at your age, it, it, it's a valid option. You could say, if, you're, if there's enough tissue in there, would you consider repairing it? Yes, I would. Okay, okay but we'd have to talk about a bit more about the risks of re-rupture. Yeah. And that's two seasons out.
something like that. So I suppose, do you have any more questions for me? Or, or should we just talk? No, no, no I just want to hear that. Yeah, so my, my input would be, um, you need to approach the first three months anyway, as if, my opinion would be that as if you're going to be non-op, you need to make sure you optimize the rehab in the first three months. And if you do really well, and you pass all your tests, you have, you have, you have your options open to you. Mm -hmm. So um, there's obviously an argument about when is the best time to do the surgery. Um, that's probably another discussion. Uh, and in the young with one that's you know, doing pretty well and with your timelines, we might be inclined to do it sooner rather than wait, but we know the evidence, especially in the partials is probably weighted to the non-op, but given that your, your standard, it's a worthwhile question about whether surgery is the right thing for you. Now, we also know that there, there's some studies that show that, you know, if you believe you need it and believe you want it, you probably, if you go non-op, you might convert to having it anyway, because it's difficult to get that mindset yeah. in the right place sometimes. And then if you struggle to kind of feel that you've made the right decision, you're more likely to sway towards the, the graph. So we sort of, uh, we brought we will because it's an interesting discussion. This can go kind of either way. And, and this is where it's important to be open to the fact that the patient is really important. And, uh, their and, and take, I don't I don't like the partial diagnosis. Yeah. I don't like the partial diagnosis because if you tear your AM bundle, which is one of the big bundles of your ACL, in effect, you're defunctioning. Okay, there might be a few fibers hanging on, but there's stretch on the ligament before it turns. So I say I always use the rubber band analogy. You know, you can take a rubber band between the femur and the tibia, and you can stretch that rubber band. Okay, now your leg's doing that, but it's not ruptured. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, it's intact. But we don't treat the scan. The ACL laxity is clear. I think when when we when we videoed the patient just now, I think from the side view it's pretty 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 yeah. dramatic, and and we have to weigh it up. So obviously, when there's no no pressure, no time, yeah, time stop still. You have go and eat your heart out on non-operative rehab. If it keeps giving way or or you you fail it, you can have an operation, yeah. but. I know what you're worried about because you've already told me and your yes. dad has an email. He's doing all that rehab. Doing it and then doing it again after the surgery. And, yeah. and, and, and we don't know the answer. What we do know is if you go on to tear your menisci, we probably made the wrong, wrong decision. Um, if you play with pivotal instability, you will lead to meniscal tears. And as we discussed before, many times meniscal tears lead to meniscectomies, lead to arthritis. Um, and, 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 and yeah, it's not quite as good. So that, that, that the horse has bolted a little bit, although it's possible and, and you know, you're, you're, you're lucky. You, you, you might have the facilities to, to get your operation quickly if you wanted it. Yeah. But also you might be able to get the best rehab. Yeah, yeah. so, so it's, a, it's an important decision and um, not one I expect you to make right now. Yeah, no, maybe no, Maybe yeah. some of these people online will tell us what they think if yeah, you've got any questions. Um, cool. Give us an idea of how much force goes through your knee. When you're, you're right-handed on the left knee, you take yeah. your, you drag your feet, you were telling me. Yeah, so there's a technique called a drag flip, which is from a short corner in hockey. Yeah. And that's where you will theoretically lunge into your left knee and will put all that weight and force from coming through it, through that left knee. So my worry is if I do all the non-surgical rehab, that if it's only a small amount left, like you're saying, then it could just rupture because it's a lot of force that goes through that left knee. And it's important that we, so you're going to go and have a, uh, your first session tomorrow with a very good physiotherapist, yeah, yeah. I think, right? So he's going to assess you and between us all, we're going to come up with a decision. Yeah. yeah. And it's your decision, but all we can do is inform you to the best we can. Yeah. You do have to have a realistic expectation of what, what your chances are. And I'd be interested to see what Andy says. So what would you say his chances are of getting back to sport at elite level are? Well, I don't think there's a lot of data to necessarily give you all the information, especially in, if, we, if we make it age-specific and uh, sport-specific. There's probably not much data out there, but, you know, 50% probably. You know, he's got a 50% chance. However, 50% is not a... But for non-operative. Yeah. Yeah. So for operative... Right, young male, go back. They do. Yeah. And the higher level you are, you go back. Okay. For middle-aged people like Andy, 80% <laughs> will go back, I think. But not maybe to the same level. Yeah. 
yeah maybe 90 85 90 yeah elite football like the premier league that you know we're talking upper 85s 90 percent. but if you're talking as you come down the peg and, and certainly as there's probably less money in sports you might be reducing that yeah. that rate a little bit more as well and there's a big psychology element which we can talk about at some point but that's part of your rehab program do you have any other questions no i think it's a lot of information that are <laughs> yeah and, and we'll counsel you obviously as, as you go forward thanks Will. all right yeah cool. thanks will cool. cheers thank you right. yep so i'm going to talk a bit about um deviations um oh, it's, it's going to be a little bit post-op a little bit um some that may not have had operations as well um the the plan is to talk about the ones that i see regularly in clinic um we're still on the wrong camera uh, and try to go through those debating how how we can manage those more effectively okay so i'll, I'll go past that the common causes of deviations the you, there are others but these are the ones that i'm going to talk about today uh, angry knee swollen knee stiff knee the painful knee uh, weakness uh, and as we sort of briefly touched on psychology so this is a knee not to sit on if this is the knee that walks through your door uh, i i would urge you to be picking up the phone, speaking to the surgeon, packing them off probably to, to a &E, uh, or see a doctor. Um, the angry knee has a few causes, a few potential causes. The more common ones I would say are a wound complication. So if you, you know, uh, infections around the wound, for instance, uh, the, this doesn't happen as often nowadays. We're pretty explicit about keeping the, the wound dry. We dress them well and we make sure the patient is up to date on how to sort of manage that wound with, uh, with dressings and whatnot at home. Uh, joint infection again i'd say this is even uh, less common but it's one it's important to note this can happen if you're seeing a very red very angry knee very swollen very painful potentially with discharge um, this is one to be expediting very quickly uh, and then the dvt uh, DVTs, again, they're not, I, I say more common, they, they do happen. I don't see many of these, but the DVTs are those, they're going to happen in the first few weeks normally. Um, sometimes if they've you know, taken a chance and gone for some travel, but sometimes they just occur and there's not much you can really do about it. They often walk in with a, uh, you know, that tense, that red calf, that one that we all know about. But, but the first thing is that they don't normally, they're not normally able to straighten their knee. They're walking with a stiff knee. They're in a lot of pain uh, and they're telling you something has gone wrong. The less common ones, hardware issues, um, uh, an allergy to metal components. Again, the, normally we've, we, we have screened for these, so these are very unlikely. I would say the way that we need to manage these is you need to communicate early. If you're worried about that knee that walks in and it doesn't look right, don't sit on it. Make sure you pick up the phone to the surgeon, perhaps, or if you're really concerned, write a letter, send them off to any &E and get them to have a look. If you're lucky enough to have a sports doctor in clinic like I would, I'd be banging on his door and saying, come and have a look at this knee, please. And almost all of these angry knees are going to end up getting some diagnostics, whether it's a Doppler for a DVT or further scanning and whatnot. This is a more of a rehab point. If you've got these angry knees, it's important to stop and, and make sure we get the diagnostics done. It's important that we take care with this, but try not to then stand off the knee once we've got it resolved, once we've got it on track again, because you can easily make this person do worse and worse and worse if that knee's actually ready to go and you're standing off because you're a little bit worried. So stop as necessary, but don't stop too long uh, with the rehab. I think if it's a hematoma and it's not an infection and then you waste six weeks yeah, exactly. and you could be getting that hematoma down and then they're going to be left with a big stiff knee. You know? Yeah, exactly. And we don't want to stop for too long because it's a long enough uh, process often, especially if we're talking ACL anyway. Uh, the persistently swollen knee. Now, this this is a this can be complex. You know, there's there can be lots of reasons why someone might present with a, a persistently swollen knee. Hopefully, you can see the left side appears to just be carrying that effusion all sort of around the knee. You can see a little scar on there. Um, these these persistently swollen knees are tricky. If they've got a persistently swollen knee, they're, they're probably going to get weaker progressively. They they normally develop a, a stiffness, and that might be some of the reason behind it. Um, but also, there could be other reasons that that perhaps are causing this knee to be swollen. That's, that's, that's what we're going to go through. First things first, uh, where is the swelling? You know, if it's fairly localised in one region, perhaps we're talking sort of uh, fat pad, for instance, or is it gross swelling like we saw in that image? Uh, if it is gross swelling on, on, around the knee and it's persisting and staying, then we, we probably need to be having a look at this. 
is it infected? You know, if, if this is brand new, not like the knee I show, but if it's brand new and really swollen and it's looking red, as I said to you before, we're not sitting on this for too long. And then finally, has there been another event? So like uh, Will spoke about earlier, where there was a pivoting, twisting, where he ended up um, uh, unfortunately injuring his ACL. If they've had surgery and there's been another event, a slip, trip, fall, we need to know about it. So if you see that persistently swollen knee, you make sure you ask them, has something happened that you're not aware of? So a few differentials that don't include the, the event and the infection and such. Uh, think about the fat powder, sort of mentioned that at the front. This is common. You know, if you're pushing too hard, if you're doing stuff, perhaps maybe when the knee's not ready for it, you can end up with a puffy knee at the front, especially in those ACLs uh, and arthroscopies where you've gone through the fat pad to get into the knee. Uh, meniscus and cartilage, these are a bit less common, but, you know, if it's very swollen, especially if it's stiff and it's presenting perhaps with a catch or a clunk or something like that, Perhaps we've got a mechanical block or a mechanical reason why this knee continues to stay swollen. Uh, weakness, we said already, this is probably secondary. So, you know, if it's swollen and it, they're not doing their rehab and it's got weaker, then you get into this kind of vicious cycle. Uh, I've often called it the sort of cycle of doom where you end up getting weaker, more painful, stiffer, and then you just keep going around. And that, that is a problem. Uh, and then finally, we mentioned stiffness. If they're walking on a fixed flexion deformity, the kneecap is going to be getting more load. They're going to be stressing areas in the knee that are probably going to be quite unhappy, especially if they've had surgery. So you can end up with this. It's a bit more localized. It's a bit more around the front rather than that kind of gross joint fusion, but you're going to end up with a swollen knee. Uh, and I mentioned too much too soon. And we'll, we'll sort of go through too much too soon. But this is probably the most likely if you've got small amounts of infusion. If you've got big amounts of uh, like a really large, like sort of hemophros or big sort of effusion around the knee, you may be talking some of the ones that I've, I've mentioned just above. Um, it's key that we don't forget the outliers. You know, I've, I've said uh, the few of the most common. These are the are less common. You know, perhaps they've ended up with a graft rupture. Something's happened with the hardware. Perhaps if it's a, a maybe a knee replacement or such. Have you missed a, a, a pathology in the knee previously? Was there a posterior lateral corner that we mentioned that unfortunately got missed or didn't get the right surgery? Or was there a meniscal root perhaps that again got missed and is creating instability that's causing a problem? Rheumatological flares, we know they can happen if they've got rheumatological problems. As soon as you cut like psoriasis, for instance, you can end up flaring those uh, rheumatology um, considerations. And, and something that's happened to me recently uh, not me personally, but one of my patients has had a, a, hema, a hematology diagnosis, which he wasn't aware of until he ended up having a, an ACL uh, reconstruction and unfortunately ended up with this gross um, effusion uh, or swelling around the knee, which was further investigating. It turns out that he's got uh, a sickle cell trait, which has uh, sort of enabled him to, to produce more, more swelling. The knee was wetter and as such, uh, he's slowed down significantly because it took us longer to get him, uh, get him there. The stiff knee. Um, the stiff knee, it's important to understand if it is stiff or whether it's, I'm going to call it pseudo stiffness. Is the knee actually stiff or is, are they worried about moving it? So again, I keep asking why, but you know, why is this patient, why has this patient got a stiff knee is, is the most important question to ask. You know, have we got a mechanical block? Have we got a large effusion that they can't get past? Have we got a, you know, really puffy fat pad that just kind of getting in the way it's making it sore or are they walking on a fixed flexion deformity or, or sorry a, a stiff bent knee because they're worried about straightening it because it hurts or because they think that actually if they straighten it they might damage the surgery that's been done and the first thing I'll tell people when they come back to clinic and after they've had these surgeries especially the ACLs is look this is really strong you can straighten this knee and you're not going to damage that graft there's if there's Certain concerns or restrictions that we need to talk about, we'll talk about those as well. But straightening the knee is fundamental. You have to get that to happen straight away. And like with Will earlier, we've seen that he, he's not too happy about straightening his knee because of pain. We don't want that to last too long. He, that's something which I've spoke to him about today. We need to be getting that knee straight frequently, often. Use your pain relieving strategies if you need to. Ice your pain relief, however you need to go get that knee to calm down in with regards to pain so you can get that knee straight so you can use your quads and you're going to be able to return to your activities faster. So on, on the straightness, I think it's more important. People get sidetracked on the brace. The, bra the brace can contribute to fixed flexion. Definitely. And so I, you know, it's, it's really important that for all the knee surgery that the brace, apart from a non-operative MCL, the brace comes off 
you know, get your exercises, get your straightness, get your full, get your full extension. And for meniscal repair in particular, I'd rather take the brace off. Yeah, and this is, the, it's important to have that dialogue, isn't it? And understand that, so we're fortunate that we've worked together a few times. I, I know I can phone you and say, look, look, Paul, this brace is causing us more problems than it's helping us. Can we get it off? And that's a conversation you need to be able to have with your, with your consultant. The knee's got to be straight. The biggest red flag other than infection, for us. So. Definitely. Um, and as you can see, it's a big problem. I've put up a few points here why it's a problem. It's going to limit the strength. It's painful. They have a higher chance of arthrofibrosis and your cyclops lesions and such, uh, we think. Um, if it doesn't get straight, you know, you, you may need to go in there and have further surgery. Um, generally, if it's stiff and stiff for a long time, my clinical experience would say they don't do as well. Their end point probably isn't as high as those that do well at the start. Um, and I think we probably need to manage that expectation early. You know, if they're struggling and I have been struggling for some time, there may at some point need to be a discussion to say, look, your end point is further away and it's, we're finding it tricky now. It may be tricky to get right to the top. I'm not saying we're not going there, but it's important to manage how that conversation goes and how that rehab goes. And like I said, time scales are going to be greater. Um, not sure if you can see this. This was just a little matrix I thought was quite nice. I found this. It's about um, total knee replacement, actually, but it just talks about arthrofibrosis. The top bit is about potential risk factors for why you might uh, develop arthrofibrosis. And the bottom is actually about what you might do about it. The bit that I found important here, and there's a, a couple of boxes at the top that talk about if it's not straight before the surgery and you've had a history of having problems, it's going to be harder to get that straight uh, knee back. So it's essential they go in with a straight knee. Painful knee. Um, this is probably the most common. This is the one we see the most. This is the deviation I would say that most of us are used to dealing with. I normally talk about this at the start. Knees that have had surgery are going to be painful. We don't know how quickly that will go away, hopefully within the normal timeframes. But you may find as we go along, some pain creeps back. It might be different to what you've had before. It might be in a different area. We will manage it as we go. It's important that you let me know how the knee tolerates the sessions but it's likely you will have pain at some point. Again, it's the same question, I suppose. I should have just put this question up and stuck with it, really. Um, why do we have a painful knee? It's important to consider the above um, diagnoses. These are probably the most common at the top, and then the others that uh, can um, contribute are below. The ones I'm going to go through are the ones in blue, mostly, uh, or just below the blue box, sorry. And the first um, we'll talk about is fat pad or PFJ. So uh, I think this is an important differential because you're going to manage these differently. You know, if you've got a fat pad versus a PFJ, if you just do a blanket treatment for both of those, you're not going to get to where, where you want to go. Um, so you have to work out what you think is causing the problem. And these are some of what I would say clinically I see that help me differentiate as well as them saying where it hurts and having a look at it. These are some of the points um, I would say. You, you can ask me something. No, I'm going to ask you. Go yeah, you, you put it on the slide, but in 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 reality, yeah. How do you differentiate pat, pat fem pain from fat pad? So the first thing I think is uh, they're gonna they're gonna have a quite a localized. This is where it hurts yeah. versus kind of this is where it hurts, and that is a, a good differential for sort of patellofemoral pain or or generalized patellofemoral um, soreness versus a fat pad. Fat pad is a lot more local. You normally get that kind of camel sign, the little kind of lumps, um, and it's it's what it hurts with and what makes it better. I think is probably the easiest ways to, to you know if you jack them up in a heel raise and they feel great, you might you might say well this probably is a fat pad because I've taken some of the load away from it. If you jack them up into a heel raise or you get them up on their toes and you get them into more a uh, less extension moment and their kneecap hurts, you're probably thinking it's more of a kneecap. And that's a kind of quick way to go. Tape is another one. You know, take some of the pressure away and that'll, that'll make you feel better do you find what, what, what's your sort I, of... uh, from a surgeon's perspective i'm always thinking fat pad yeah bear in mind that i've been in the knee and had a look at the pat fem joint so yeah. unless there's obvious problems there and you know there's a pat fem problem um and then but then fat pads you know with or without a stiff knee yes uh, yeah, yeah. um so i think the fat pad without a stiff knee is common what we see yeah, and so the hyperflexibles, yeah. the you know the the females that are hyperflexible, that perhaps have low gem, lower muscle tone, perhaps less exposure to strength, maybe less quad function, that are very flexible. 
you could be thinking fat pads. And then obviously the angry knee with a fat pad and a patella femur <laughs> and it's tight and it could be all of them. Yeah, exactly. And you, you, you often see some of these intertwining. Uh, these are some of the, the management strategies I've gone through a few already. You can have a little glance through. Um, fat pads, I'm thinking, look, stop loading the quads if you're doing too much. Do what you can. Maybe complex or muscle stim the quad if you can't load it because it's too sore. Focus your attention on the posterior chain whilst you calm it down with either NSAIDs, loads of ice around the front um, or an injection if it's gone to that point. PFJs, unload it if you can. Think, you know, I think tape works in, in these. I know there's a debate about how much tape does in terms of actual biomechanical change, but they like it. It helps, and I'll go for it. Often it probably comes with your stiffer knees, so you need to be thinking range of motion. Patella range of motion is another one that often people won't get involved with, and then load the quads. Um, it's important to ask why. Um, have you done too much too soon? That's probably your fat pads. Um, if you've pushed extension too much, really push it in the early phases, or if in your PFJ, if you've, if you've overdone maybe some of the deeper, stronger exercises without having all your sort of function. Uh, we said uh, lack of knee extension. If you've got uh, a lack of knee extension, your exposure to sort of anterior knee pain is much higher if you've had an ACL. Uh, kneecap mobility I've already spoke about. Quads, you need to make sure the quads are king, as we know. And if they've had a, a bone patella bone, or a patella graft, sorry, or, or a quad tendon graft, which we don't see as much, you've got a higher chance, and this is why Paul's asking about kneeling, you've got a higher chance of generally irritating the front of the knee because that's where you've taken the dome from. Okay, um, some points on the patella tendon. I won't go into this too much, but we know it gets a bit more sore, especially around the front. These, these are kind of ways you can try to work out if this is a problem, how you might manage it. If you can't load the front of the knee early, think about how you can change that. BFR, muscle stim, adjust the range you don't have to bin all the movements you might just have to change how you apply the movement you know people worry about knee extension machine for instance i can't do open chain knee extension because it's going to irritate the kneecap you can you might just have to change the range you might have to make it isometric you might have to reduce the load do it with bfr muscle stim whatever you can do it you can load the quads you just need to think about how Okay, uh, if you've got anterior, anterior knee pain, you know, we say 80% do well with ongoing rehab, but there is a portion that if they're presenting with anterior knee pain, especially if they've got maybe an audible clunk or a click or whatnot, that that may be a sign of something else. And here I've, I've used cyclops lesion as, a, uh, as an example that was discussed in this paper, but not all of them are going to recover perfectly. And you need to be open to the fact that some of this may be uh, another pathology going on in the background, and that's important. So Again, if things are lingering and not progressing, it's important to have that dialogue with the consultant. Mm. Uh, finally, uh, last few reasons, you know, lateral tendesis, you're going to get more pain. Uh, meniscal repairs, you're going to get more pain at the start, um, probably because you can't use the knee as well and you're not going to expose it to certain positions in weight bearing. So generally, they can be a tiny bit grumpier. Multiligaments are complex. It's a big surgery all sorts of structures involved often come with ligamentous or chondral damage. So that can be a problem. And Paul's already mentioned about chondral surgery. If you're, you know, if you're going in and trying to deal with the cartilage, then it's more painful. And that's why there's a period of non-weight bearing or adjusted weight bearing to make sure that, that does well. Okay. Weakness. Um, weakness. Quads are king and queen. We know that. I spoke about that a lot. I speak about that a lot on my page. You need to make sure you get your quads back. If you've had knee surgery, probably the biggest indicator of how well you're going to do um, especially in the early to mid stages, how good are your thigh muscles? They're the bits that deal with most of your, your big heavy knee function. They're the grunt muscles. Um, get get uh, extension. Uh, understand that atrophy after surgery is different. You know, there are other factors at play. It's being irritated, swollen. There's more going on in the knee and, and there's been a big assault. So you need to maybe change your um, strategy to return in function. It's probably going to include more eccentrics. You're going to really load it up, use muscle stim, all those other factors to really promote hypertrophy. Uh, don't forget pain. Make sure you manage that. Um, and like I said, make sure you've discussed with the patient, educated the patient that it's okay to push if they're ready for it. If they've met their markers, push them. Don't sit on it and wait and focus on band exercise. If they're ready to push, push. Uh, as we said, apply the principles of training. Be specific to the area you're trying to address. Overload it progressively. You know, if you're talking quads training, you can't be sitting with a green theraband, sitting on the edge of your chair, doing knee extensions if you want your quad to be able to tolerate a high velocity, change of direction, pivot sport, playing hockey. You need to get strong. 
Um, make sure you educate the patient, as I've said, use adjuncts, um, uh, isolate for the win. That's, uh, I'm talking knee extensions. If you want your quads back, there's lots to show that you need to isolate the quads um, and make sure you've got full extension. I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot. <laughs> Um, but these, these things work. And if you've got a deviation, breaking it down to the things that work, the, the simple strategy is important. And often it's because we're trying to go too quick or we're trying to get to the fun stuff that causes the problems. Just quickly on quads, when are you going open? When, when do you go open? Uh, so between two and four weeks, I'll have already sat them down and done an isometric with a ball perhaps up against a wall, just gentle pushes and getting that going full open chain. I mean, there's more and more saying you can do it as long as their pain settled. Um, I tend to find if you go a bit too early, they're probably not confident. Mm. Um, and I tend to short arc them um, okay. early. So I manage it normally after four weeks, I'm going a bit, a bit more like the Fukuda paper that we mentioned, which I'm, I'm happy to post. Final piece. This is the bit that everyone forgets. Don't forget about how the patient feels about their knee. That's important. If, you know, if they're not confident, they're not going to be able to apply the principles you spoke about. As you can see here, self-efficacy or the, the way they feel about their knee can dictate their function. You know, psychological readiness to return to sport is a key indicator. We must, must, must assess this early. Don't do this when they're just about to return to sport. Take it before you start the rehab, preferably as soon as they've had surgery and gradually, progressively retest that through the process so you can educate them. If there's a big thing they're worried about, talk about it early because then it's going to mean that when you bring that phase in, you've had those conversations, you should be able to progress a bit faster. I'll go through that one. Uh, how do we improve psychological readiness? Like I said, uh, test, uh, educate, and discuss. Uh, I know Paul had a fancy diagram. I made this one, so that's why it looks a bit messy. Um, but what I wanted to put on here is, is some of the deviations that we've already spoke about and how that might change the rehab process. I've picked an arbitrary two years. Um, I'm thinking you utilize an ACL for this. The black line shows what people might expect. As you can see, I've shown there's a dip off after the 12 months where it comes down a bit. And that's normally because they've regressed their training and they come off of their, you know, how good they can be. As you can look through the angry, the stiff and the painful knee, there's deviations. The angry one's going to happen early. If they're going to need debridements or draining or injections, like you know, they're going to start slow. The stiff ones tend to come a bit later. You know, they're already not doing amazing, but, you know, maybe around the, one to three month mark or further, they're going to start to really struggle. And then if you can get that, if it's not, uh, if it's not mechanical, perhaps it's just a pseudo stiffness, you can kick them on again. But if they're going to end up having off, off a fibrosis surgery and whatnot, that's going to take a little bit longer. The painful that, as you can see, I tried to make that wiggle around a little bit. It can come at all sorts of times, but basically around that four to five month mark, that's when impacts coming in. That's when you be, begin it. Well, that's when the big impacts are coming in. Sorry, that's when running might be introduced. That's when you're going to increase the load. That's when you're starting to bring in ply more plyometrics and really ready them for some of those sport specific drills at sort of more six months. So everything ramps up at that point, which is why you can get a deviation. No journey is the same. It's important we appreciate that and have that discussion. And we sort of tried to discuss that a little bit with Will about, you know, we kind of give you as much as we can, but nothing, we can't really give you a time frame. This is what we think from our clinical experience. And this is how you manage it and manage expectations. You talk early, you give them realistic timeframes. It's bespoke. No rehab is the same. Will's journey will be Will's journey. There won't be one like it. And you make sure you go through that. You set goals together. That's important. And you discuss criteria early. What does he need to achieve at one month, three months, five months, six months to enable him to stay on track? If he deviates and comes off of it, we reset. We talk about that deviation, where it's taken us and what we need to change after that point. Um, it's not a time-based recovery, if, especially if we're talking ACL, but with all injuries, really, you have to meet the checkpoints. You have to go through the criteria and make sure you discuss common pitfalls. Like I said, if it's, you might have pain. It might be stiff at the start. You might get a sore fat pad, et cetera, et cetera. What, you know, if you think there's going to be deviations that might occur, talk about them. With discussing uh, sort of returning to activity and, and that sort of thing, are there any sort of specific tests that you return, you, you advocate for return to sports? Yeah, I mean, you know, you can get, this is a presentation itself, I'd say, but you, know, you must make sure you test strength. They need to have their mobility. They need to be tolerating impact. You need to make sure you're taking psychological metrics, so readiness, that sort of thing. You need to make sure you've thought about power, you know, I would say reactive strength. Um, the tests I use, depend on the person, the sport they're going back to, but, you know, isokinetic testing is useful, handheld dynamometry strength testing, 
there's lots of um, there's lots of uh, psychological kind of metrics like the ACOR RSI that you can use. And then normally you're going to need something. If you want to do really high end rehab, you need a force plate really to get your rate of force development and your jump and your land. So they're sort of some ideas. Okay. You can, you can watch Andy go through it on the off the webinar we did. In, yeah. In yeah, yeah, yeah. That was brutal. Uh, and also you mentioned about psychological readiness. Do you, do you use any sort of outcome measures for that? Questionnaires yeah, so and that sort of thing? Probably the one I use most is the ACL RSI. It's a simple 12 point um, questionnaire. You can, there's even a short form actually, which is six questions, I believe. And that's got fairly good evidence as well. They can get an app for it. They can fill it out. So that's probably the one I would say is the most easily used. Uh, and I, that's the one I'd pick alongside a couple of others. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'll whistle on from here. Yeah. Oh. Um, final point um, we said we'd talk about is Instagram. Um, it's important that you don't get your rehab from Instagram. It's a highlight reel. I've stuck Paul's uh, mugshot up on here. This is... This is where I post all the good stuff that I do. This is why I post the guys that sail through their recovery and are killing it and doing all the fancy drills that everyone likes to watch. So I use Instagram as a tool. I'm going to say why I use it as a tool. I know Paul does as well. Uh, good question, Paul. Do all of your total knee replacements run down the corridor at six weeks or whatever? Yeah. They all do. No, no, they all do. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, no 90% of them. Now, of course, you put your good stuff on and actually... Case studies are a good way to learn. That's what I use on Instagram. I try and make them educational. But yes, you know, if Will's playing England hockey at the World Cup nine months after non-operative or operative, you know, you know, we might post it. He yeah. might send us a little video and we might go, look, well, what a great decision we made or Will made or his dad made or, you know, and, and, and of course we want to do that. But it's not real. Yeah. I've touched his knee now. So if he plays for England, then it's because of me. That's good. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so this is the warning, and this is kind of what we spoke about. Um, it's it really reflects the normal daily struggle. Deviations from perfect um, are rarely presented. Not many people will put up the things that go wrong. Um, it shouldn't be a place for to com for comparison for patients or for clinicians. All journeys are individual. Like I said, it's a highlight reel. It's good for tips and pointers, but it doesn't replace structured rehab as we spoke about. It is good for an opportunity for a discussion. Um, cannot and should not replace a therapist, I don't believe. And I've seen, I have seen some people that have kind of done all their rehab uh, online and come to me four months down the line and are struggling. Um, and be aware, like if it's negatively affecting you as a clinician or you as a patient, perhaps don't don't dive into that. If it's causing you problems and you can't get away from the comparisons, leave it alone. On the Instagram thing, um, I know your contact details are there. You know, you and I both suffer or are asked daily for an opinion from patients on Instagram. And that's not the way to get a surgical opinion or a physio opinion or an opinion on a knee, because you know th that is one of the perils of social media. We, we see it on Twitter as well. Yeah. Could you help? I'm stiff. I've got a stiff knee four months following uh, surgery or my ligament's still uh, broken. Can you fix it, et cetera? Or can you help me? I can't move my knee. You know, it, it's a difficult social media and we need to be careful on that. Yeah, I think you can cause yourself problems if you engage in too many of those conversations. Um, I always say to people, it's impossible for me to give bespoke medical advice over social media without seeing you. And as such, I only want to deal in bespoke medical advice. I need to see you if you want my opinion. You know, I post plenty of informational tools that hopefully people can engage with, but that is not designed to replace a the therapist. And if you really want an opinion, you have to come in, basically. Yeah, and Andy and I, you know, our actual clinical work overlaps very little. Yeah. You know, yeah. and we both work with other surgeons, we both work with other physios, and, you know, we weren't there. So me giving an opinion on another surgeon or Andy giving an opinion on another physio, we weren't there at that moment in time. So, you know, it's very easy to be critical on social media. It's very, very easy to just treat a scan or go, what does this scan show? And we've clearly shown that Will's knee is extremely loose on clinical exam, but treating the scan, it's, it's less bad. Oh, we might get away with it, you know, down the physio route. And you've seen a physio tomorrow, and I'd be interested to see what his physio has to say. Um, so yeah, but be careful about social media. Not all the answers are there. By all means, learn from it. And I think it gives you the, um, of what is possible, the art of what is possible, I suppose. Yeah, the most important thing about it is that you follow me. Yeah, follow, <laughs> <laughs> follow Andy. <laughs> if you want to know about quads uh, 
Uh, nice. a, a bit of banter as well i think that's fun so we have uh, a few questions if that's okay um yeah. if you in they they have full knee range or even some hyperextension post-op would you exclude the knee hang position normally given or would that be something you would still include um i'd ask them to maintain it actively if they've already returned all of their passive ex passive range i just want them to be able to control that that range so i probably wouldn't really fuss too heavily about them pushing into extension if they've already got it i would say right well now we need to get control of that range and a question really about diagnosis but but very soon after injury so for example in the case of of will uh, what are common mistakes are made as a physio in on-field diagnoses um obviously you have pain swelling tenderness and that sort of thing how do you categorize them which one would you prioritize well this is tricky on field there's lots especially if you're talking elite level there's lots of pressure you need to do it quickly i would say to get a good diagnosis you probably just need a couple of tests and if you're worried about the knee irrelevant of what you think is going on like if you go over and you lack the wheel and you think there's an acl you pull him off and you do the rest of the testing off the field um if i'm i'm an r in about a diagnosis and whether it's serious i just i'm not going to fuss around with an on-field assessment being the be all and end all yes i think you can lack them yes you can kind of mcmurray's it yes i'm looking for range i get them up what does it feel like how do you feel if, it, if they haven't reported popping they haven't you know they haven't reported any kind of instability feelings and it's not that painful and improves when you get going i might let them go but it's I, I don't mess around if it's a problem and i think it's a problem i'm pulling more they're um, not going to play on if they're badly injured their knee yes. yeah okay. okay but um as i'm not going to plug his page because he's doing a good job of that himself <laughs> he does go through some case stories you can see some pretty horrific videos on his posts um on his stories actually and and some of those you think have torn everything and they haven't yeah, yeah. so even when you see the injury you know, oh, it must be an ACL, you go and assess them, they might be okay. They might have hyperlaxity, et cetera, you know. Um, and this is a much larger question than we can answer here, Paul, but um, do you consider patella tendon graft a, a stronger graft longer term? What are your thoughts on patella? Yeah, um, I'm a sprint, sprinter, rugby, wing, center, football, center, wing, hockey it's pace sports i'm gonna i'm gonna have a i'm gonna have a patella tendon i think but it's important the surgeon knows how to do them i think most acl surgeons now will do this a la carte either quads patella hamstrings do let's repair the meniscus i think it's not one graph fits all so yes i think it's slightly stronger i think on balance the evidence will tell you in 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 the high performing surgeons the patella tendon is probably a titchy bit stronger, but with more morbidity. Um, and you mentioned when you were talking about uh, fat pad and PFJ, um, you were saying that you might use muscle stim or, or things along those lines. Obviously, not all NHS hospitals have that capability. Um, how would you suggest they maintain quads uh, in those yeah, situations? That's tricky. I mean, they're like i mentioned at the time i would modify the position that i apply a quad strengthening in to allow them to utilize their quad in a pain-free range so you could simply get them doing um, an isometric knee extension um, against a wall with a ball for for instance or against the band you know outside of 60 degrees where there's not much pressure and they'll probably find there's not much pain um so I, i'd use that but i we don't have loads of muscle stims in clinic i get patients to buy them early doors I, I, if they're having an acl they're already i've already and paul knows this i'm telling them right you're having your acl you need to buy a complex unit they're about 150 quid and you're going to use it for nine months it's worth it okay thanks very much um so that's most of the questions i think uh, i'm just going to pass over to stuart uh, and he's going to close off the session thank you very much thanks Thanks, guys. Thank you to Paul and to Andrew for all that work. Uh, a really good session. Nice to see banter between the two of them. Uh, we should have some more webinars coming up uh, in the coming months, so keep an eye on your inbox. I do apologise to Andrew for calling him an orthotist. I mean, probably the worst thing you could possibly call something, somebody. Uh, but a big thank you to Giles, who does all the, the back office stuff, makes all this happen from a technical point of view, uh, and also to Sherry. But I think we can all agree the star of the show tonight was Will. Um, so hopefully we'll see you well again uh, once he's starting to play hockey for, for England. Uh, but take care and we'll, uh, we'll see you all again soon.